there are many wonderful attractions in Ayrshire. Sandy beaches, beautiful villages, the Killeen Country Park. Golf courses second to none, the Scottish Grand National is held here. And last but not least, the Burns Country. What better place to start than the county town of Ayr? Described by Burns as all the air, while near a tomb surpasses for honest men and bonny lasses. And the boat Venel, just off the Sandgate, is Ayr's oldest house, the Loudon Hall. It was built in 1513 by James Tate, a wealthy landowner. It passed to Sir Hugh Campbell, the Earl of Loudoun, in 1528. In 1891, a monument was built to Robert Burns in what is now known as Burns Statue Square. The Tam O'Shanter Inn sits in the middle of the High Street. This thatched building was at one time a museum incorporating Burns' famous poems, but it now has reverted to its original purpose. In 1470, the old brig was built to replace an earlier wooden bridge, and it's still standing today. There is no doubt that this is Ayr's most outstanding feature. In Burns' time, a new bridge was built about 200 yards downriver, and he created a poem about it at the time called The Taw Briggs. He was very critical of it. The poem stated that the old brig would still be standing when a new brig was a shapeless cairn. And true to these words, that's what happened. The new brig was destroyed by flooding 90 years later and the old brig became the replacement bridge until a new bridge was built. The starting point of any trip to the Burns country is the Burns Heritage Park. From here, everywhere you look there are constant reminders of Rabbi's links with the surrounding area. His cottage is just around the corner in Alloway's main street. In 1756, the poet's father leased land in the main road through the village. In these days, Alloway looked nothing like it does now. This simple old clay cottage was built by the poet's father, William Burns, and in January 1759, Rabbie was born. In Burns' own words, a blast of Janmore wind was so bad at the time of his birth that part of the cottage collapsed and the family had to move until repairs were completed. The monument and gardens were built beside the Brigadoon to honour Burns. On leaving the monument, the wonderful old cobbled Brigadoon comes into view. The old brig offers visitors the opportunity to walk in the very spot that Burns used as his climax to his most wonderful poem. In 1789, Burns was asked to create a poem to add to an eerie picture of Kirkalloway. The response was pure genius. This epic poem is regarded by many as his best work, Tam O'Shanter. Tam, a farmer from Shanter Farm called Douglas Graham and his friend Souter Johnny were used to drinking a little too much in market days. Tam's cousin owned the inn in Ayers High Street and Tam made good use of it. On that particular night they had enjoyed themselves a little too much and by the time they had decided to return home they were a little the worse for wear, or in Burns' words, Uncle Foo. They claimed to have seen witches and warlocks dance in the ruined Kirk of Alloway, and it was only down to Tam's quick thinking, because of his knowledge of witches, that they managed to escape their clutches, a running stream they dared across. It would provide him with an alibi why he lost his bonnet and a good bit of his horse's tail. Bum's account of this was a classic. A spring brought off for Master Hale, but left behind her own great tail. Now do thy speedy utmost, Meg, and win the keystain o' the brig. There at them thou thy tail may toss, a running stream they dare na cross. The wonderful humpback cobbled bridge was built in the 15th century, and at that time it was the only bridge over the River Doon. Last century a new bridge was built nearby, and the intention was to demolish the old one, but it was sensibly preserved because of its links to Burns. The brig was probably saved because of a few lines in one poem. But what a poem! This 600 year old bridge is now famous throughout the world. A short walk from the Brig of Doon, and almost directly across the road from the hotel, is Kirkalloway, a ruin in Burns Day. Part of this tale took place within these medieval walls. This is where Tam supposedly watched the witches and warlocks in a dance. The Kirk is alleged to be haunted. But I think it all depends on how much you've had to drink. Robert's father, William Burns, is buried here in the kirkyard, together with his wife Agnes. The original stone was badly eroded 
and the present one contains an epitaph by Burns. Burns' sister Isabella is also buried here. Kirk Alloway is now ruthless and was already a ruin in Burns' time. It fell out of use after the parishes of Ayr and Alloway were joined in 1690. On a day such as this, Kirk Alloway seems quiet and peaceful, no different from any other Kirk, but visit it on a wild rainy night with the odd clap of thunder, then I'm sure it would be a totally different experience. William Burns moved with his family to a farm at Mount Oliphant in 1766, but he struggled to make it pay. It is thought that many of the poet's health issues stem from his time there. At the age of 13, he was more or less the main labourer. Eleven years later, the family moved to Loch Ree Farm, a few miles from the Bolton. His father died in 1784 and Burns took over the farm there. It is interesting to note that in his time there, he went to learn flat spinning in an attempt to make the farm pay. The current owners at Loch Ree have just built a whisky distillery in the farm. Maybe Burns should have set up an illicit still there instead. I'm quite sure that he would have made a lot more money from that venture. But 13 miles from here is Kirkoiswold, and sitting in a bend in the road is Suter Johnny's house. A shoemaker to trade, his real name was John Davidson. It's now a museum. It was restored, then passed on to the National Trust for Scotland. Burns attended school here in the summer of 1775. This is where he met some of the characters from his poems. Tamashanta, Suter Johnny, and Captain Jean, who helped run the Captain Inn. They are all buried in the local graveyard, along with many of Burns' relations. Burns' mother was born and brought up here. The Burns Heritage Trail leads to some strange places. In 1781, Burns took up work for a couple of years to learn the trade as a flax spinner in a heckling shop in the Glasgow Venal in Irvine. This house, number four, was where he took up lodgings for a shilling a week. By the 1700s, Irvine had become a major West Coast port. It was actually the third busiest in Scotland at the time. And the Glasgow Veno was so named because it had become part of the main route from Irvine Harbour to Glasgow. That route was favoured by the Carters because it avoided the toll in the Irvine Bridge. Burns grew flax in Loch Lee Farm and he was being trained as a flax spinner in the thatched heckling shop at the back of this cottage by Alexander Peacock, a relative of his mother's. Burns' plan was to grow flax in Loch Lee, then heckle it. He wanted to utilise it for profit, but he found it a laborious process and he certainly wasn't enjoying it. In a letter written a few years later, he wrote that his partner was a scoundrel. The sad episode ended with the heckling shop being burnt to the ground, and he was left like a true poet, not worth a sixpence. The statue of the carter and his horse by David Anand was unveiled at the harbour site in 1996. In the time of Burns, Irvine was one of the main ports for Glasgow and carters plied their trade, transporting goods from the busy harbour here. The same carters that used the Glasgow Veno. It was here into Bolton that Burns joined the Masons. John Richard's Alehouse in one Sandgate to Bolton was a popular meeting place and this was where Burns and six friends set up a debating society, the Bachelors Club. At that time, they were all single men, so the name seemed appropriate. The quaint thatched 17th century house is unchanged from Burns' time. Downstairs, we find a living space, while the upstairs room was the largest of its kind in Bolton and was used for many social events. This was also the meeting rooms used by Burns and his friends. The house was occupied until 1928. It lay empty for a while and was earmarked for demolition. Then, in 1951, the National Trust stepped in and it was renovated and rethatched in 1971. A drive of six miles brings me to Mochlin. I was met with a huge sign of a curling scene, but a glance to the opposite side of the street shows that Mochlin is not just famous for curling stones. 
Rabbi Burns lived in Mochlin for four years, and this was the childhood home of his sweetheart, Jane Armour, who later became his wife. A statue stands in the square, facing the main crossroads. Most of his famous poems were composed here. On the opposite side of the main street, we come to an interesting lane. Nancy Tinnock, who's in Burns often frequented, stayed here. It's also where he rented rooms with Jane Armour. Burns originally moved to nearby Moskill Farm in 1784, and he could never accept the extreme radical views of the church, which held great sway in this parish. Many of his poems of his time here were aimed at the narrow-minded, uncompromising clergy and their zealous followers. The words behind me are from the Burns poem, The Holy Fair, and it is still held here annually each May. People come from near and far to join in the fun and festivities, and Mockland's quiet streets and lanes are transformed. We even have the odd vintage car making an appearance at the cross. It's been a long time since I clapped eyes in one of those. The lane leading to Nancy Tinnock's was a lot busier now, with many locals in period costume. The lanes and wines were packed with stalls offering every bargain imaginable. It was a wonderful day out. We often attended the Holy Fair in Mochland. The craft stalls and the home baking were always a big attraction to Roberta. She seemed to have a wonderful eye for a bargain. The street entertainers and the screaming preachers are always an attraction here. The courtyard was a setting for the bum satire, the Holy Fair. Nowadays, the stalls and festivities stretch into the grounds of the parish church. From the church grounds, Pussy Nancy could be made out below. It stands at the right of the cow gate. There's an opportunity to quench your drift here, as Rabbi would have done. Pussy Nancy and his friend Gavin Hamilton are buried in the kirkyard here, as are many of Burns' children. The little village of Failford sits in a bend in the River Ayr. It's about halfway between Terbolton and Mochland. The most prominent part of the village is a row of houses lining the south side of the sweeping bend in the road from Ayr to Mochland. There are no shops in Failford, just an inn dating back to the late 19th century. The River Ayr Walk passes through the village and the inn is a perfect watering hole for walkers. This is where the River Ayr meanders its way through the deeply wooded Ayr Gorge, a beautiful and romantic area. It was here that Burns and Heel and Mary parted in 1786. He wrote, That sacred hour can I forget, can I forget the hallowed grove, while well, by the winding air we met, to live one day of parting love. Mary Campbell was a Gaelic speaker who was born on a farm near Dunoon. She was called Helen Mary because she spoke with a lilt. Burns met her when she was housemaid to his friend Gavin Hamilton before moving off to work at Montgomery Castle on the outskirts of Failford. This had been a difficult time for Burns. He was struggling to make the farm pay and he was having problems with the kirk regarding Jean Armour's pregnancy, and her father vehemently opposed his marriage to her. His only way out was to emigrate to the West Indies with Mary. His friend Gavin Hamilton advised him to publish some poems to finance his voyage. Mary then moved back to the noon to make arrangements to emigrate to Jamaica with Burns, but she died of typhoid while giving birth to Rabbi's child. They parted here, in this romantic area known as the Air Woodland Gorge. Despite that setback, Burns' plans to sail for Jamaica were still well underway. His poems were published, as his friend Gavin Hamilton suggested. Over 600 copies of the Kilmarnock edition, which was dedicated to his friend, were published at three shillings a copy. They sold out within a month. He then received a letter requesting that he published a second edition. That changed everything. He wrote, I had taken the last farewell of my few friends. My chest was in the road to Greenock. I had composed my last song about ever measure in Caledonia, when a letter overthrew all my schemes by rousing my poetic ambition. Burns stayed, but it was not plain sailing, though he did marry his sweetheart Jane Armour in 1788. 
He took on a farm near Dumfries, but couldn't make it pay, and gave up farming in 1791. He then became an excise man, but that just gave him the time and money to give in to his two big weaknesses, women and drinking. Tam O'Shanter was written while he was in Dumfries. Burns died of rheumatic fever at the age of 37, after falling asleep at the roadside in a particularly wet night. The last of his children was born during his funeral service. Burns died in 1796. After all, a man's just a man for all that, as he said himself. But his works and his memories linger on. His past is entwined throughout the Ayrshire countryside like a cultural web. This truly is the Burns country.